Shalom, friends, and Bochim Abayim. I'm so glad you decided to join me here for a very special series. Because of the magnitude and the significance of this particular series, we have decided to break it to two parts. This series title, D2 in Gathering, the Anusim, and the Coming of the Messiah. No matter if you are Italian, Spanish, or Portuguese, this teaching applies to all group. And that's why we translated it to multiple different languages. Now let me caution you, just before you entering the first shiur in this important life-changing series, you're going to hear things that you have never heard before. I promise you. Some of the things that you're going to hear are difficult to understand, are difficult to digest. You will have to hear them multiple times, especially when we come to prophecy. Remember the rule of prophecy. In prophecy, God gives you a blank piece of paper and a pen. And he said, you determine and you decide how and when this prophecy is going to be fulfilled. This is going to be important. I can tell you already that the decision for the end of the Anusim, the scattered of the house of Israel, depend upon you. So my prayer to you today is that you hear God's voice and you fulfill these words of Psalm chapter 95, verse 7. The question is, when Messiah come? And the psalmist answer, today, if you hear his voice, may, through this teaching, you will hear the voice of Hashem, and may he cause you to get up, turn around, and to return to the house of Israel. Today in the first year, I'm going to deal with both history and starting to touch a little bit toward the end of the prophecy. In the second year, I deal strictly with prophecy. I hope that those shiurim will awaken your spirit and your soul as I pray for you. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Amair et Amo Israel. Blessed are you, King of your universe, who awaken his people Israel. May you be awakened today, and may this teaching will be like a match that light a fire inside of you. God bless you, and I will see you in the second part. I titled this message that will have two parts, the two in gatherings, the Anusim and the coming of the Messiah. I want to warn you that we're going to look today at some of the events that are related to the end times, to the last days. Remember the rule that I told you before. There are 70 faces to the Torah. And today we're going to look at one of the most chilling prophecies as related to the nations, Gog and Magog, the Anusim, and the salvation of the house of Israel. How appropriate it is to speak about this on the eve of Pesach. However, let me caution you. I'm not here to give time 
tables, time frames, or even exact sequence of event. All what I'm here to do today is to give you the words of the prophets of Israel, the rabbi of Israel, so that you and I will understand it together. It is says in Sanhedrin 97b, Amar Rabbi Yonatan, Tipach Atzman Shel Mechashvei Kitzin. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani says that Rabbi Yonatan said, May those who calculate the end of days will be cursed, as they would say, once the end of days that the calculate arrive and the Messiah did not come, that he will no longer come at all. This is an important topic to talk about. The issue that is at hand, the issue that we are going to be deal with, with today is an issue of the last days of Acharit Ayamim. The issue of Anusim is an issue of secret, of secrets, the hidden upon the hidden. Now when we're talking about the Anusim, first we need to define the term Anusim. The term Anus comes from the Hebrew word to force something, to force something, somebody. The word Ones, for example, in Hebrew, means to be raped. It is a term that is used to define the Marano Jews, those who used to uh, forcefully convert to Catholicism during, starting in the 14th century and on. However, in reality, though, we, we must understand this term in the context of time. It did not apply only to the Anusim in Sepharad and in Portugal. The term Anusim is a, is a generic term, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. As first, I want to look a little bit at the past and the history and understand the magnitude of what is happening this week on the Jewish calendar, what is happening this week on the Haftarah portion in Shabbat Agador, where God lined up this Shabbat as the Shabbat for Portugal. We're going to get there. But there are three distinct questions that you and I are going to have to answer today in this high Shabbat before the Pesach in this worldwide Shacharit. Question number one. Did the prophets of Israel prophesy of the story of the Anusim? And what I mean about that is the prophecy of the Anusim took place before the Inquisition, before those things take place. That is the question that you need to ask yourself, to question, you, yourself today. In, a, in other words, did Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, did they prophesy about the Anusim? Well, I'm going to already give you the answer before we jump into the details. And the answer is yes. Number two, what is the prophetic connection between the Anusim to the coming of the Messiah? This is an important question that we have to ask ourselves. What is the connection with the event that takes place today to the coming of the Mashiach, and I will answer this already, especially on the second part, and I will say much, much, in every way. And question number three, how will the Anusim be revealed into the world? How they will come about to the world? This is an important question that we have to ask ourselves, how they will be revealed. If the Anusim truly represent part and piece of the house of Israel, and the house of Israel will be complete, the question has to be asked, how will it happen? How will it come about? And we are going to look into that today together. But before we start looking at the prophetic, I want to take a moment and talk about the past. 
I want to talk about this story of the Anusim. The very first time that we see the term Anusim mentioned, the context of Anusim, believe it or not, is not in Spain, but it's in it all throughout the Middle East where Jews were converted. The first account of this is in the seventh century, late seventh century, where Jews were forcefully con converted to Islam and they had no choice either to die or to convert to Islam. So we see it mentioned in multiple areas, not just in Sfarad or in Spain. However, in general, when we talk about the forced one, the raped one, we're actually talking about those who call Cristiano Nuevo, or meaning new Christians. Those are the ones who came from Spain and Portugal in one of the greatest holocausts, one of the greatest holocausts of our people. When we talk about the term holocaust, we usually think about the Holocaust that took, took place in the 20th century by Adolf Hitler. But allow me to tell you that the same Holocaust that took place, that was instituted by Adolf Hitler, had already a spiritual root in Italy 2,000 years ago, and then in the 15th and 14th century in Portugal and in Spain. With the same root. The same thing already took place and we see the spiritual root evolve and evolve. You probably ask the question, how can something like an inquisition, a holocaust like that, that looked to extinct a Jewish race, how does it come about? How does it take place? Well, we need to understand the setting of uh, in Europe during this time. I want to remind everybody that during from the 10th century to 12th century, when we're going to talk about this in a moment, the time of Torah Azav, the golden era, is taking place in Spain, where Jewish people are being elevated and exalted, and, and the Spanish the Jew Jewishness in Spain, Spain is just exploding and flourishing we are going to talk about this in a moment. But as we getting into the 14th century, uh, specifically to the very end of the 14th century, changes coming to the Jewish people and changes are coming to Europe. You see, Europe is suffering from the Black Plague during this time, where 30%, roughly 30% of all European died during this black plague. Now during this time of the plague, the plague did not skip Spain, where the Spanish people are suffering terribly due to the, to the plague. And this time, in the year 1391, we have an event that is called Gizrot, Gzerot, exactly, Gzerot Kuf Nun Aleph, which is the decree, literally meaning Hebrew, the decree of 1391 started to brew trouble for the Jews in Europe, in Spain specifically, as a result of the Black Plague, but that was just an excuse. At the end of Tammuz, 1390, 1391, we start to see a cleansing, an ethnic and systematic cleansing of Jews. First in the city of Sevilla, then it's continued to Cordova, then it's continued to Madrid, Barcelona, Toledo, and so on, where Jews are being forcefully either killed or converted at this time. This is an important milestone in this story of the Jewish people in Sfarad. Because in this time, many Jewish people from the different levels have a choice to make. Many of them, in the, especially in the beginning of the 15th century, decide to run away 
and they're going to be running away, first of all, to Portugal, where they think they're going to find safe haven, but they did not, as we're going to talk to about in a minute. But the Catholic Church is so ruthless that they do everything in its power to either destroy the Jewish people, destroy the, the essence of Jewish life, destroy the synagogue, and to give the people this opportunity to take upon themselves a new religion, a new name. Now most of the thought is that most people think that most of the Jews who were converted forcefully continue to remain Jewish. But that, friends, is not a complete truth. Quite a few of them who took upon themselves a Christian identity, believe it or not, became the greatest scholars inside of Christianity. They became haters of the Jewish religion. Not all, but at least, at the very least, some of them. For example, the story of Shlomo Alevi, a rabbi a famous rabbi who became Pablo de Santa Maria in 1405 after the terrible decree that took place in 1391. So we're talking about 15 years later as he became the bishop of Cartagena. Now his writing becomes so popular among Catholics as he went after Judaism in strength in power to renounce Judaism and to declare the new superior faith of Catholicism. As a matter of fact, in this case of Shlomo Alevi, his writing become the fuel for the writing much later, the writing of Martin Luther. Martin Luther received much of his influence from the writing of Shlomo Halevi, who was a Jew, who converted forcefully, but then decided to, in sort of speaking, join the crowd and join Catholicism. Now, he returned into his own city of Burgos later on, 30 years later, as the great archbishop not as the great rabbi, but rather as the great Hout Archbishop. Many rabbis have converted. Many of their sons of the greatest, greatest rabbis had to either die, forcibly converted, or run away. Remember that this era of the 10th, 11th, 12th, even up to the 13th century was an amazing era for the Jewish community. So the descendants of these great rabbis were the ones who have to deal with this mess of the Inquisition that was starting to come upon them. But what about the majority? The majority of the Jewish people would have rather died or run away. So many of them have secretly taken upon themselves a Christian identity, indeed, with a Christian name, while being a Christian, going to the Sunday church, doing everything that a good Catholic would do on the outside, but inside, at the same time, they themselves continue to write venomously, venomously against the church and represent Judaism within the Catholic Church as a strong believers of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. One of the most famous one of all is the story of Rabbi Dr. Yitzhak ben Moshe Halevi, not to confuse with Shlomo Halevi, Yitzhak ben, 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 ben Moshe Halevi was one of the most famous Anusim and he wrote, uh, he took upon himself this new Christian name, which means the good faith. He wrote many writings. Many of his writings are writings that come to explain to us the 
the, the evil of the Catholic Church. He wrote all of his books anonymously so nobody knew who he was and he wrote to strengthen other Anusim, other Moranos. He wrote he, for, for the purpose to know, hey, we are still Jewish, but nobody knew who he was. Of course, internally, everybody knew who he was. This is the story of many of our Jewish people. They were forced to take upon themselves a Catholic identity in order to just survive. You ask a question, what about the government? What about the administration? The answer is very interesting. The king at this time was Juan I, who sat in Saragossa who was, with a matter of fact, a friend of the Jews. When he heard about the decrees that took place in 1391, he quickly rushed to the local uh, uh, governmental institute to speak about this terrible crime against the Jews. The, the things have stopped, the, the persecution stopped for a while, but the people who did it, they were not punished. The king even uh, praised the, the people in Barcelona and he visited Valencia uh, and he tried to calm down the fire that started against the Jewish people. But friends, the fire was already burning and it was already becoming such a great fire that nobody stopped. Even while the king was visiting, 400 Jews were killed in Barcelona, where the rest of them became, became Christians. The king was not some sort of a noble king, but he didn't want a problem with the Jews. He had a lot of connection with the Jewish people, but his ability to stop it was only temporary. What took place in 1391 was the tip of the iceberg of the things to come, which started a mass, a mass exodus from the Jews, all the way to two areas. Number one, to Portugal, number two, to uh, North Africa, to places like uh, uh, Algeria and Morocco, where this became a safe haven to the Jews. Believe it or do not, the Jews had a easier time dealing with the Muslims, being around the Muslims, than to being around the Catholics at this time. So some of our most important uh, rabbis, like the, the Rashbats, as an example, they decided not to convert themselves and at the same time to move themselves. But some of the major migration took place to Portugal. But friends, that was the beginning of the end. For example, the Barbanel family who moved from Sevilla to Portugal as an example, that was the beginning of the end. Because over the next 100 years, I want you to put two important dates in your calendar, 1492 and 1497. The expulsion took place. First, 1492 of all the Jews had to either convert or to die or to get out of Spain. And then five years later, at 1497, the same took place with the Jewish people in Portugal. We, they had to leave Portugal. So let's put it in context. 1492 first decree to leave Spain. 1497 second decree to leave Portugal. And what is the decree? The decree says the following. You have two choices, Jews. You either convert or you leave. Now you have to understand the number of people who remain in Portugal and in Spain and the number of people who left. When we're talking about the people who left alone, 
people who left alone, Spain and Portugal, we are talking about roughly 300,000 souls, 300,000 souls who left during this time. Spain and Portugal. Imagine how many more have been forcefully converted. You probably wonder where did they live to? Most of them who had money left to Amsterdam, to Holland, to build a new community of Jewish people. But those who were not so lucky, did not have all the means, they went to South in Central America on those new boats for a new world, for a world of freedom. It is true that many of the people who left, left Spain with even Christopher Columbus, who probably, more than likely, was a Jew himself, was, believe it or not, Jewish. This decree is a catastrophic decree because Hundreds of thousands of our people have been converted in this time. Some remain Christians, some have run away to find again their Jewish community. This comes in the time that is the greatest time for the Jewish people. Prior to this 1391, prior to the Black Plague, it's called the Golden Era. To the point that the Jews were so popular, they were so powerful, that even here, as you see on your screen, we read about the King Fernando, who wanted to have the inscription of the king in Hebrew. It's read, Bazea Makom, who kever Hamelech Agadol, Ram Fernando. This is the place of the burial tomb of the great king. Fernando, written in Hebrew. Why would the Spanish king would have an uh, inscription in Hebrew? It is because during this golden era, and we need to understand how important Jews were in the society in Spain, and as they, before they migrated to Portugal, how important they were. They were there not just intellectually, but in governmental official to be the leaders of Spain. For example, some of the names that you're familiar with, some you're probably not familiar with. For example, Rabbi Shmuel Hanagid, who was the second in charge for the king of Granada. Or Rabbi Shmuel Evan Gvirol, who wrote the Adon Olam prayer, what a poet. Or Rabbi Moshe Evan Ezra, or Rabbi Avram Evan Ezra, poet, philosopher, doctors, thinkers. Rabbi Yehuda Alevi, who wrote the Kozri, the Rambam, the Ramban. Rabbi Moshe Ben Chanoch, and countless others. The very best, the very best of our people were there at this time. And it is, was their descendants who had to deal with this tragedy that seek to destroy the Jewish race. Do you think that there is any difference than what Adolf Hitler did to what the Inquisition has done? Friends, there is no difference. And when we prayed and we prepared for this event today, not just to talk about the past, but to understand the prophetic future, I don't think I understand or anybody understood the date and the time that God appointed for this moment in time. The moment that you are with us getting ready for the call of the Anusim, for the call of the Sfaradim, for the call of return. I found it incredible to read the following in a Jewish newspaper just yesterday. And I quote, Reconnectar, an organization which seeks to reconnect the descendant of Spanish and Portuguese Jewish communities with the, war, with the Jewish world, applauded the passage of law, designating 
March 31st as the official Memorial Day of Vic's victim of the Inquisition in the Assembly of the Republic of Portuguese Parliament. The law, passed last Friday, received wall-to-wall -wall support from the fa faction and parties in the Parliament. This is an historic and important decision because finally there will be an official memorialization of the tens of thousands of victims of the Inquisition regime, which hundred and hundred our people for 275 years, says Perry Perez, president of the Reconnecta. Hopefully this day, will create greater awareness of the dark chapter of Jewish and Portuguese history which still cast a giant shadow across the world with the tens of millions of descendants of Spanish and Portuguese communities still disconnected from any knowledge of their ancestry. We see many of these descendants discovering their ancestries through DNA tests, genealogical advances of familiar tradition, and this law will hopefully raise another level of understanding about the deep and shared roots between the Jewish people, the Portuguese people, Latino and Hispanic populations, many of whom are the result of the forced disconnection due to the Inquisition. Brothers and sisters, it is not a mistake that we are sitting here today on Shabbat, March 27, four days away from this holy time where we will celebrate this Holocaust that took place in a worldwide shacharit that will take place today. This is an historic and prophetic event. I did not set this time in place. God did. Listen to the conclusion of this important article. A groundbreaking academic study of the genetic origin of Latin Americans at the end of 2018 found that nearly a quarter of the people in Latin America have significant Jewish ancestry. Meaning that it's ex if one extrapolates that the population of Latin America, those North Americans who which roots there, and those who from the Iberian Peninsula, there are well over 200 million Latinos and Hispanics who are descending from the Jews, who were forcibly converted and disconnected from Jewish communities in Spain and in Portugal during this Inquisition. Many of them fled to the New world, world for refuge. The choice of March 31, which chosen for the day of the remembrance for the victim of the Inquisition, because it was on March 31, 1821, that the Inquisition in Portugal was officially disbanded. This, in, this in Inquisition operated in Portugal from 1546 during the reign of King, I say, Serrao the Third until March 31st, 1821, over the course of 275 years. The Portuguese, Portuguese Inquisition alone opened around 45,000 cases, mainly against this population. Brothers and sisters, this Shabbat, Shabbat Agadol, we will read an important and prophetic prophecy in Malachi about the Moranos, about the Anusim. I want you to understand the significance of this moment in time. Today, it is so significant and so important that in four days, there will be a commemoration, a remembrance of what took place for 275 years and ended during the Pesach. Praise be to God that He has chosen this time and this season 
for this opportunity for us to talk about the ingathering of the house of Israel. Do you understand the numbers that we're talking about? When we say 200 million, they are not Jewish. And today, we will understand who they are, what they are, and what God is planning for them for the last days. So now take a breath and ask yourself the question with me. What does the Bible, what are the prophets of Israel have to say about the unseen? who have been scattered, who have been converted, who resemble complete Christians right at this moment. What does the Bible and the prophets of Israel have to say about them? To answer this question, we are going to look this morning on only one passage. We are going to look at one camera lens from the book of Yeshaya. Let me start with the suggestion that the story of Anusim will come to resolution only in the days of Mashiach. Only on the time of Mashiach. The sequence of events, well, I am going to leave that up to God. I simply want to show you the connection between our season today, right at this moment, to the coming of the Anusim and the Sfaradim. To understand it, let us go together to the prophet Isaiah in the 66th chapter, verse 17, where we read, Hamit Kadshim Vamitaharim. I want you to pay attention to those two words that appear here in the text. Those who sanctify and those who purify. This is important. And notice in both cases, it is the people who are doing the sanctification and the purification, but they do it them themselves. It's not real purification. It is not real sanctification. It's not purification and sanctification that happened with the help of heaven. It's a self-purification sanctification. It is trouble. It is not a good purification and sanctification. And it says here, those who sanctify and purify themselves to enter the groves, imitating one in the center, eating the flesh of the swine, they eating the reptiles, they eating the mouse, shall one and all come to the end, declare the world, the, the Lord. The Lord here, through the prophet Isaiah, is about to describe for us who are those two parties who seem so holy, who seem so righteous, but they are not really, they are entering into the garden. The garden represents those places of worship. They are washing and washing themselves. And they eat swine, they eat unkosher, because they are really unkosher on the inside. They appear kosher on the outside, but they are not kosher on the outside. They are they are, they are not kosher on the outside, and definitely not on the inside, I should say. Who is he talking about? And what is the connection here for the Amusim? We have to understand it in context, friends. And notice what it says in the end of the verse. It's talking about their end, their very end, their very destruction in the very end. How are they going to be destroyed? And when is it going to be taking place? Let's understand what the rabbis of Israel have to say. We have to start with Rabbi David Kimchi, also known as the Radak. The Radak says the reptiles and the mouse refer to Persia. He referred it to Iran. He is talking here, here about the end of Iran. How ironic it is that today, as we are speaking, Israel is awaiting a conflict, a major conflict with, with Iran. And look what Radak saying here in the text. He said, 
when is the end will come? The Rebson repaired to, Par to Persia by Milchemet Gog Magog. This passage that we are reading here is the beginning of Milchemet Gog and Magog. He is about to describe to us Gog and Magog and somehow, according to Rabbi David Kimchi, the, the war of Gog and Magog going to involve Iran. But the problem is, and I'm not saying that the Radak necessarily is wrong, is the fact that it's mentioning two different groups, Mitkachim the Metaharim, two groups that claim to be really holy, two world religions, two world powers that really seems to they are really holy, but they are not holy. And he says this, the Ramad Rabbi Moshe David Valley, one of our greatest Italian rabbis. He says, it is well known that the two kingdoms that are controlling during that are controlling during this time is Ishmael, which represent Islam, and Isav, that represent Christianity. Brothers and sisters, according to the Ramad, those two words to represent the two different people who sanctify and purify themselves, speaking about Islam and Christianity. The question is, what Islam and Christianity going to do? Well, there are two possibility here to the text. Possibility number one, that they are collaborating together. This is possibility number one. And possibility number two is that they are fighting each other. But even if they are fighting each other, make no mistake, there is no good or bad here. They are both evil. According to the understanding of Judaism, the final war of Gog and Magog will take place between the nations and between Islam. And in a minute we will see where Jerusalem and where the Anusim, where are they fitting in all of this story. Yitzhak Abarbanel go even a step further and he explicitly tells us who is it speaking about. And I quote, The scripture refers to the sanctification and purification as a reference to Islam who appears to be holy, who appear to be pious in their abundant washing. You know, in Islam they pray five times a day. The one who sanctifies himself and purifies himself appears as such, but he is not truly pure. And then Paul Banel continues and he says, on the Christians it is says, the eaters of the pig the reptile and a mouse. The prophets speak of their end together, as it stated in Deuteronomy 12, 22, as they eat or collaborate or fight or quarrel together. Now, before you jump and say here, whoa, 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 are you telling me that all Christians are going to be destroyed? Wait just a moment. We are going to get there so that you will understand it. Okay, this is very important to understand it in a proper context. So when it says here, mitkachin who mitarim are the those who appear, they appear to be holy, but they are not, and they are going to be fighting. Now, the question you need to ask yourself, where is the fight going to take place? So more than likely, we're talking about the war between Islam and the nation, Iran and the nations. We are in these days, friends. We are literally in these days. This was written in some of those commenters uh, close to thousand years ago, friends. Listen to the next verse has the Lord himself starting to describe how their end will come. Remember, in the end of verse 17, he's speaking about their end. In the verse of 18, God speaking about their very end. And it says, for I know their deeds and their purpose. So there is a purpose. 
beyond this fight, beyond this war. In a minute we'll understand what is the purpose behind this. And he said, the time has come to gather the nations and the tongues that they shall come and see my glory. This is verse 18. Now when you hear it, the time to come to in gather the nations and tongues, you are immediately thinking about Isaiah chapter 2. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord when the Gentiles are going up to Jerusalem. Friends, this is not the in gathering that you are thinking about. This is a very bad ingathering that is taking place. It's a negative ingathering. It is an ingathering for the sake of destruction. It's, a, it's, a, it's ingathering for the sake of destroying something, somebody. I'm going to already give you the hint. They're ingathering, they're fighting here against Jerusalem. This is a picture of the very first ingathering, not the ingathering of the house of Israel, but the ingathering of the nations to destroy Israel. And that's why Abraham and Ezra connected this ingathering to the ingathering that is mentioned in the book of Psalm chapter 2. Listen to Evan Ezra as it said, it is the same meaning as the rulers takes counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed one on the words and see my glory I shall punish them till they will declare my glory to all people this passage refers to the war of Gog and Magog. Heaven has to tell us here that this ingathering that is happening, the ingathering of the Gentile is the ingathering against God, against the Messiah of Israel where they are about to see the glory. When God speaks here about the glory, he doesn't mean it in a positive way, but in a way of punishment. We are standing here today in what called the Great Shabbat. Shabbat Hagadol, as we prepare ourselves for the day that we are reading here, for this first in gathering. Shabbat Hagadol represents the first in gathering, the day where God is going to deal with the enemies of the house of Israel. And we see that in a minute, salvation is going to come with this, even to the Anusim. May his name be praised. Rashi go and continue. It says on the word, They will see my glory mean when I wage war with them with the plague of the following description. Okay, their flesh will disintegrate and their eyes and their tongues. He quoting here, Rashi, Zachariah, chapter 14 to explain what's going to happen in this war. It's a resembling of a holocaust of atomic nature, like nuclear holocaust. The flesh is distinct, the eyes, they will become corpses because they will melt. That's why it says in Malachi chapter 3, this Shabbat, that everything is like a furnace of a fire that is going to take place and come together. So Rashi is explaining to us that the glory represents a complete and other destruction. Now remember that I explained to you before that there is an ingathering that is taking place. It's a very bad ingathering. And it's like a Barbanel explained to us what is the purpose behind the ingathering. He said, the ingathering that is mentioned in the passage is upon Jerusalem. There will be a war between Islam and Christianity close to Jerusalem. And at this time, there will be a great trouble unlike anything that we have ever seen. On this great vengeance, it's the prophet who declared, they will see my glory. 
there will be the authentic glory of God as the prophet Ezekiel state, stated those will, man, will I manifest my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the sight of many nations we are really talking about a world war that is going to take place and it's going to start in the Middle East this is a world war that's going to be a great destruction upon the world and it's going to start between Islam and between the Christianity or together because somehow this war many will turn against Jerusalem the call of the war is going to be Israel Israel is going to be in this war. Now you're probably wondering what that have to do, to do with the return of the Anusim and the glory and the Kavod and the coming of the Messiah. We are getting there. During this time, there will be something that supernatural will happen during this holocaust of the war. It says in verse 19, I will set a sign among them and set from them survivors to the nation, to Tarshish, to Pool and to Lud, to draw the bow, to Tuval, Yavan, and to the Stisis coast, that that have never heard my name, nor beheld my glory. They shall declare my glory among this nation. I want you to notice what's happened here in this war. There's going to be a group. It's called the remnant. They call in Hebrew the plitim, the remnant. Okay? And those remnant are Gentiles. And according to this text, those remnant are Gentiles, they're not Jewish, but they're Gentiles who are going to be sent to other Gentiles. And you ask yourself the question, how can Gentiles be sent to other Gentiles? It does not make sense that Gentiles will be sent to another set of Gentiles. I want to explain it to you under the lens of the Holy Spirit that you will be able to understand this. There are two sets of Gentiles here. Those who are completely indifferent, those who do not know the God of Israel, and those who survived this war, who are the Gentiles who survived the war? Well, in a second you're going to see the answer. Because God have a purpose for them in the salvation of the house of Israel. They have a unique calling. And notice the very first place that they're going to go to. They are going to go to the place called Tarshish. Tarshish is Spain. Tarshish represents Spain and Portugal. There is a reason that they are about to go to Tarshish. And the scripture says here that they are going to have sign upon themselves. What is this sign that they are going to be taking upon themselves? Sign in Hebrew means a letter. Maybe they will have some sort of a letter upon their forehead. I don't know. But here the rabbis explain it to us. So first of all, number one, let's understand first of all, who are those Gentiles? Who are those Gentiles who are going to go to the other Gentiles? And what's going to happen when they go to the other Gentiles in the far islands? It says by Moshe al he says, the nations, who is the ones who are going to be the refuge of this great and terrible war, great and terrible day, the nations who did not commit transgressions and did not persecute the son, Israel. God will make them refuge to go to the rest of the nations, to the rest of the world who are far, who have not heard about the glory, and they will not, and they will proclaim my glory among them so that they will believe and will know the words are true. I will put a sign among them that that will be supernatural. Those 
who are today brothers and sisters from the nations, those today who join themselves to the house of Israel today will be spared from Gog and Magog in this great first in gathering against Jerusalem. There will be a nuclear war, there will be a tra tragic war. But if you cleave yourself as a Gentile to the house of Israel, you will be spared. Because God has a purpose for you. And here even it says by Yitzhak Abarbanel in the Mishbatzot Azav, a great commentary on Isaiah. It's explained what is the sign because Isaiah tells us that they will have a sign, but he never explained what is the sign. To understand what is the sign, we have to go to the prophet Zechariah who speak about the same event and explain to us what is the sign. By the way, the Hebrew word sign is the word ot, but it also means pele. Pele, if you flip the letters, is the word aluf, the name of God will be upon them. But the word pele also is one of the names of the Messiah. Pele, your it's El, Gibo, Avi, Ad, Sar, Shalom. One of the names of the Messiah is Pele. And look what it says. They will somehow will have the sign of the Messiah as they're being sent out. Those are not Jews who sent out or Gentiles. What it is have to do with the Anusim? Listen carefully. First of all, here is the sign according to Mishbatzot Zaav. It says the sign that is mentioned by Isaiah and it is not interpreted by him. The prophet Zechariah interpreted the sign and explained the situation in Jerusalem like that. As for those people that warred against Yerushalayim, against those people warred against Jerusalem, who spoke against Jerusalem, the Lord will smite them with a plague. Their flesh will rot away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall rot away in their socket and the tongue shall rot away in their mouth. That is from the prophet Zechariah. Yet I will send survivors among the nations to declare the miracles. In this Haftarah, this week, in the great and terrible day, it is saying that many will die in these things, that they will rot exactly what Zechariah said. But it says, on you, on some of you, the sun of righteousness will come with the healing in its wings. It will come with healing in its wing. Why? You will not die. You will not perish. You will be healed. And then the Gentiles will try, will start the fully, fully, the, the last step in their fullness, in their fullness process. What they will do? They will go to the Goim. And why? You ask the question, why are they going to the rest of the Goim? Because they are going to find a surprise inside the Goim. Inside the Goim. He, we are going to find all the scattered of the house of Israel. All the Anusim. And the job of the Gentile will be to bring the Anusim back back up to Yerushalayim to their real in gathering. Remember what he said, put a sign, go to the Gentiles. And we're going to learn that in the second lesson. But in conclusion of the first part of this message, look what Rabbi Yonatan Hishbit said to us. He said, the words of the prophets, I will set sign among them and sent from them survivors represent the beginning of the real gathering, the second and final gathering of Israel, the authentic gathering of the house of Israel among the nations. Although those Gentiles, he's speaking about those Gentiles, they were forcibly converted 
as Anusim, all of them will return back and convert. Remember, they are not Jewish. How will it be known during the time that they are Jewish? In essence, ask when the Gentiles will go to them, how will they know that they are Jewish? And there is a great, there are great multitudes who are mixed with the Gentiles, who lost all connection or memory to the house of Israel. The one who know their thoughts. God Almighty will notify them by revelation and they are the children from the house of Israel. My brothers and sisters, those who are joining me this morning, this evening from the Anusim, among the Anusim, the reason that you are being awakened today to the Jewish roots of your faith, because the time of your salvation is almost here. Somehow when the Gentiles go to proclaim it, everybody will have a supernatural download and God will reveal Every Jew, everyone from the house of Israel who have been scattered, who have been gone, he will reveal each and every one of them. He will do that without a doubt. Without a doubt. He will do that. And it will be an awakening. There's an important story that I would like to share with you in the conclusion of the first part of the message. This is just the beginning of what God is going to do with the Anusim in the final days. I hope that you will be with us in the second part of the message when we will see what God planned for the Anusim. They will be awakened super naturally. During the time of the Holocaust, Adolf Hitler invaded Holland and when he came to the great Sephardic synagogue, the great Portuguese synagogue, he built the, the Third Reich headquarters inside the synagogue where the train tracks take, took the Jews straight into Auschwitz. Now, at the same time, he found those great treasure of the great Portuguese library, where he decided to take it in joy back to Berlin as a prize. As he did that, and he took it back to Berlin as a prize, he never opened the collection. Each book was numbered. Each book had a number, and we're talking about thousands upon thousands of books. Upon the end of the war, they found in Berlin those giant containers with the books. They took him back to the Etz Chaim library and they opened it. For their shock, not even a single book was missing. Not even a single book was missing. And that's what is Rabbi Yonatan Ipschitz, an Ashkenazi rabbi, tell us. That not even one Ben, Ben, Ben Anusim will be missing in this day. Because he will be awakened from above. He will be awakened in these last days. The fact of the matter that today you are being awakened. Sfaradim, Portuguesim, you're being awakened today. He's a sign of the things to come where millions upon millions upon millions will be awakened and will start the journey back to the house of Israel, returning back home. Today we are in the evening of Pesach. And I pray that you will be awakened today. It is time to spiritually hasten the word of the prophet Isaiah by saying to you, Shuvu, come back, return. It is time to be awake, arise and shine. God is not true 
and he will gather one by one the entire seed and the entire house of Israel. Have no fear. God will return one by one those from the house of Israel. If you are from the nations and you are not banned on the scene, look at the role God has for you. If you are banned or bottoms and you think you are, then get ready today. Prepare yourself today. Come back. Shuv. Thank you.